Hi, I'm Leila Malik, and I've been working on interactive pedagogy and AI research at the Wharton School. And I'm Ethan Malik, a professor at Wharton. And together, along with Wharton Interactive, the organization that we help run, we have been really passionate about how you can democratize access to education. So how do we get everybody the kind of education that we give at the University of Pennsylvania? And one of the really exciting things that's happened in the last year has been the advent of practical AI. So our goal in this video series is to show you some of what we've learned and some of what our research has shown about how AI can be used in classrooms, both the upsides and the downsides, because we're in the middle of a very big transformation, probably one of the largest in recent history, that is going to affect every part of what we do as as teachers, as learners, as workers, and we wanted to give you a little bit of a preview of how that world works and some practical tips in the course of the videos about how to make it work for you. Before we get started, here are a few things you should know. First, it's that AI is everywhere. Everyone has access to the most powerful AI model in the world, and students are using it in all kinds of ways, including to cheat, and we just can't tell if they're doing so. AI is undetectable and continues to be so. AI is our first general purpose technology since the internet, and it touches everything we do. It transforms how we live, how we work, and how we teach. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how to get access to these systems, what they mean for teaching, how to use them. But before we do that, I think it's worth talking a little bit about what we mean when we talk about AI. Because AI has had many meanings over the years, and a lot of them are not very precise, right? You might think of the Terminator robot as AI, or the computer HAL in 2001, or you might think about AI for self-driving cars, and those are all different meanings than when we talk about AI for today. Prior to the last couple of years, what AI meant was usually about machine learning algorithms and prediction. That meant we were trying to use machines to predict data based on past behavior. So when you went to an Amazon website, it would try and guess what products you might want to buy based on your past buying behavior and analyzing tons of data about how people make buying choices. Or when you were using a self-driving car, it was trying to predict where to drive on the road based on lots of data and what the data came from its cameras. But these systems were very bad at human things, human language, human creativity, until a breakthrough. In 2017, a famous paper called Attention is All You Need came out that suggested a new way of creating AIs that were good at working with human language. These Models used processes called transformers and attention mechanisms, and what resulted was something called a large language model. So when we talk about AI now, we often talk about these large language models. So ChatGPT, Bing, Google's Bard, Anthropic's Claude, all of these are large language models. At the same time, there's also been new models that are very good at creating art, video, and all sorts of other kind of creative tasks, including audio. And all of these things together, we consider generative AI. So large language models, art-based models, video-based models. This is this new category of AI that's very different than before. So when we talk about AI in these talks and when you hear AI being used, mostly we're talking about this kind of generative AI about creating new content. And we should spend a second talking about how large language models work because it can be helpful to both understand what we do know and what we don't know about their advantages and disadvantages. All AI models are based on prediction, trying to predict what happens next. Large language models are a little different because they're about predicting what word or part of a word comes next in a sentence. And the way they've done that is through a training process. They have ingested all of the information on the internet, billions of documents, and over the course of months of heavy computer time, have come up with a model for how language works. They found secret connections between different words. They found some words are closely associated with each other, like you know, fox and dog might be closely associated with each other, or banana and papaya. And it's, but it's also found other connections about how these words operate across many different dimensions that we can't even fully understand. Using all of that knowledge then, the AI tries to predict what word comes next in any sentence. So if you say, I like to use AI because it's very good at, it will try and guess the next word after at. Maybe it's prediction, maybe it's lessons, maybe it's guessing. And it will try and predict what's next and then give you that next word. So it's like a fancy version of autocomplete. And that's basically how AIs work. They have additional forms of training on top of them, there's other mechanisms, but they're essentially an autocomplete mechanism on steroids. 
So large language models first started to actually appear in the wild in 2019, 2020, and they were interesting, but not particularly amazing to work with. You wouldn't actually think that these were good writers. They were writing at sort of middle school level. And, you know, they were interesting, but mostly ignored. Something happened though, with the release of ChatGPT in late 2022. ChatGPT ran on a new version of an older language model. It worked just the way other large language models worked, but it was much larger. And that seemed to create a new kind of AI, something that was far more capable than we ever had expected before. And one of the ways you can see this is by looking at test scores. So previous large language models couldn't do tests at all. And then ChatGPT started to score really well. We were getting something like, you know, at the 25th percentile of the GRE, the graduate exam in quantitative testing, 66th percentile, beating 66% of humans in the GRE qualitative, doing really well on the AP exams, doing very well on SATs, completely unexpectedly. And GPT 3.5, the chat GPT model was just the start. GPT 4, which was released just a few months later, was scoring in the 99th percentile in the GRE exams in verbal and scoring at the 85th percentile in the law exam. And this was a completely unexpected thing. We didn't expect these AI models to be as capable as they are, as powerful as they are, as quickly as they become. And we didn't expect this trend to keep continuing. And it's not just test scores. AI makes us all more powerful and more productive. In a series of recent studies, workers had higher productivity gains in terms of writing tasks and coding tasks. They were faster, they were better, and produced higher quality work across the board using ChatGPT. The jobs and skills that are most affected by AI are probably not the ones that we thought would be affected early on. So when we talked about AI in the you know, early days before large language models, we thought about AI automating difficult, repetitive, dangerous tasks, you know, driving a truck or doing mining. But it turns out that more recent work has shown that AI is actually most disruptive and most connected to higher paying, higher educated, more creative work. So generally, the more you're paid, the more educated you are, the more creative freedom you have in your work, the more generative AI is going to affect your job. That doesn't mean it's going to replace your job, but it does mean that it will have a big impact. And one of the groups that's most impacted is actually teachers and instructors at all levels, which is part of why we wanted to make this video, to talk about how you can use this to help you rather than something that's just to be nervous about. But we have to think about how we're preparing students in the future for this kind of world as well. There's a lot of different ethical concerns we might be worried about with AI, and some of those will be getting better over time, some worse, and I wanna just make you aware of a few of these kind of concerns. So they start with how these models are trained. They're trained on everything on the internet. So not all of that is paid, some of that's copyrighted. So how do you feel about the fact that these models have all of this information in them? Now, you can't directly reproduce, in most cases, copyrighted material, so if you ask, the AI to give you the first paragraph of a famous novel, it will almost certainly not give it to you correctly. Uh, you can't directly ask for someone's data and get it from the AI, but it is trained on everyone's information. And that raises concerns about copyright and about fair use that are still being resolved by both courts and you know people discussing it. And then because these models are trained on everything on the internet, they also exhibit biases that can be very human biases. And additional biases are put in place as these AIs are trained and reinforced in different ways. So if I type into an image creation software, something like show me an entrepreneur, I'm more likely to see male entrepreneurs than female entrepreneurs, which could be a real problem because it's reflecting biases in society and biases of how these things are trained. And so that's something you wanna be aware of too as you use these systems. And then moving up an additional level, we start to consider, well, what does it mean to ethically use these systems, right? Is it okay for us to replace human effort and not tell people about it? Do we expect people to show their work? And we'll talk more about plagiarism, but plagiarism concerns become a real issue where we're copying AI use. And then at the highest level, what does AI mean? We have a device that sort of thinks and acts like a human in some ways. Could, be, could it be smarter than a human at some point? What does that mean for society? What does it mean when we start passing over some of our thinking and work to AI and stop thinking and doing that work for ourselves? These are all questions that we don't have easy answers to. So we have a tool that's immensely powerful, that is very useful, that can transform teaching and learning, and we'll certainly do that, but it also raises a bunch of concerns. And I think we need to be balancing those things out and thinking about them as we continue to work with AI. 
This is the first of a series of videos that we're creating, and next up you'll hear about a variety of large language models, how to prompt and the right way to talk to the AI, and how to use AI as a teacher and as a student to further your learning.